check, check, check. Hey, there we go. All right. Maybe it was only 10 seconds. How many of you guys enjoyed a beautiful 55 degree morning this morning? Woke up, a little touch of fall in the air. Yeah. Woo! Made, you, made me get up and want something from Starbucks with a pumpkin spice taste, didn't it? It was just a wonderful feeling. A little taste of fall in the air. Fall is one of my favorite times of year. It's a time to celebrate, it's a time to worship. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to ask you to take this moment to go ahead and stand as we begin giving praise to God with the song, Jesus Messiah. He became sin, who knew no sin, and we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing. say the same here because I'm trying something new and uh, because of that I'm going to stop while I'm ahead before I jump into a key that I can't play. Sing with me. These are the days of Elijah. Trials of famine and darkness and sword. Till we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on a cloud, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Amen. 
Amen. You guys are singing like you believe it. We got a reason to celebrate this morning. And these are the days of Ezekiel. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant. people said. Amen. Amen. I want you to take a moment to turn and greet somebody, particularly somebody that you don't recognize or that you don't know. Tell them you're glad that they're at Marietta First Church in Nazarene this morning. Okay, now, before you get too comfortable and sit back down, I'm not quite ready for you to sit yet. But I want to tell you a story this morning about a man that you may or may not have heard about before. His name was Little Johnny. Little Johnny was born in 1723. He had a Christian mother, and a, his father was a, sea, uh, sales, uh, a sailor, a sea shipping merchant. Little Johnny... Uh, his mother passed away when he was seven years old, and that was the only spiritual influence he had in his life, and so Johnny went to work with his daddy on the ship. And he learned that the shipping culture back in the 1700s was not really a friendly place to be, especially for a child, but he learned the ways of the world very quickly, developed a very bad attitude, and as a result of that, became inscripted into the British Navy. And uh, <clears throat> Johnny's life continued to spiral downward. And he got involved in the slave industry, in the slave trade, and uh, became very involved in that for a number of years. And little Johnny turned into a guy named John Newton. John Newton <coughs> was one time in the middle of a terrible storm returning from one of the slave trade ventures or voyages that he had been on and cried out to God in mercy, God save me from the vile, wicked creature that I am. And you know what God did? I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't say, no, I've given you too many chances. I'm, I'm done with you. He said, by grace you are saved through faith. Now, the rest of the story about John Newton is that he spent the rest of his life fighting against the slave trade. What a blessing. Not only that, but he wrote 280 hymns devoted the rest of his life to serving Christ. Now, I'm going to give you two, two quotes of John Newton. Because I'm not what I ought to be, and I'm not what I want to be, and I'm not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I used to be, and by the grace of God, I am what I am. Here's one other quote. He says, this is in his later years, he says, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. So he ended up writing the song that most of you guys know, the most famous song that has probably ever been in the Christian faith, called Amazing Grace. Is that right? We're going to sing it a cappella. Ready? One, two. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's blind, but now. was grace that taught my heart to hear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. And so we can sing. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy brings unending love, hope and a future when we seek Him with all our faith. sing one last song before we go to prayer and it's one of my favorites it's I need thee every hour it's based on 1 Corinthians 5 21 listen we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God for God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God Let's sing together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, 
You have been standing for a while if we're going to have prayer in a moment and if it's okay for you to stand and you're comfortable that's fine but if you feel you need to sit down that's okay too uh, Lawrence and Pat Hudson have been attending our church for the past several weeks and Lawrence is a former Methodist pastor and also an evangelical method uh, Methodist pastor served as a district superintendent for the evangelical Methodist Church is now retired, but they are just wonderful, wonderful people. I don't know if you have met this wonderful couple as yet, but uh, I've asked uh, Lawrence if he would come and lead us in prayer this morning. Truly, as we have sung, we do need the Lord every hour every minute every second I wonder if you have a need or a concern that you would like to bring to God this morning just privately and silently I do not know your needs your pastor would know them much better but there may even be some that he doesn't know let's take just a moment of silence so that you can lift that concern to God before I lead us in our corporate prayer.
Father, we bow in your holy presence this morning to worship you. We are completely unworthy to come into your presence, but we come pleading the merits of the shed blood of Jesus who made it possible for us who believe to be acceptable in your sight. Indeed, you are great. The amazing grace about which we have sung is truly amazing, even beyond our capacity or John Newton's capacity to put it into human words. And so we humbly and reverently bow before you this morning to give you glory and honor. We thank you for all of our blessings today. Truly, we are a blessed and fortunate people. You have been good to us and blessed us in so many ways and at so many times. And we give you thanks. Indeed, we thank you most of all, though, for the greatest blessing of all, and the best gift of all, even your dear Son and our dear Savior. Father, we thank you for hearing the concerns that we lifted to you privately and silently a few moments ago. We thank you that you are adequate for every need. And even if you don't answer all of those exactly as we would like or exactly when we would like, you are still God. And you do all things well. And we simply thank you for hearing us when we come into your presence. Father, we want to pray today for the country in which we live. Our pastor has brought to our attention so very rightly how much trouble we're in and how much we need you. We are in all this trouble because we have turned our backs on you. We haven't just ignored you, which would be bad enough. We have defied you and rebelled against you. Lord, please forgive us and please bring us to repentance so that you can forgive us. We pray for our leaders from the White House to the courthouse. Help them, Lord. Help them even if they're not asking for your help, and we hope that they are asking for your help. But help them anyway because you can work in strange and mysterious ways. Lord, we know that as a society, as a civilization, as a nation, we deserve your justice. But as you extended your mercy individually to John Newton, would you please extend it collectively to the United States of America? We do not deserve it. If we did, it would not really be mercy even. So we do not deserve it, but we do plead for it. Lord, as a nation and as a people, please somehow get our attention and bring us to our knees in humility and repentance and faith before you have to bring us to our knees in humiliation and tragedy and disaster. As we pray for our country, we also want to pray for our church. Lord, we pray for this local church, for the district of which it is a part, and for the denomination of which it is a part. We we rejoice in what you have done here in this very place, on this very property over the last three years, and then what you have done over many more years than that besides. We thank you for the leadership of this pastor, and we ask you to bless and help him and his wife. We just, we just ask you to prosper your work here and to increase the harvest 
in a way that would bless many souls and in a way that would bring glory to your holy name. And we make this our prayer now in the precious and holy name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Thank you so much, Lawrence. You may be seated. Well, it's been a wonderful morning, has it not? And we're delighted to have each and every one of you here and those of you that may be with us for the very first time. Uh, you'll find in your bulletin a connection card, and if you would fill, uh, just please take a moment to fill that out and drop it in the offering plate that's going to be going by a little later in the service. A special thanks to Lynn Empey for filling in for Ann Joyner this morning as Ann is ill and was unable to be with us, and we ask that you would be praying for her and for her recovery. And also, wasn't it great to see Mary Jasper on the platform this morning? Wasn't it? I think we just need to thank the Lord for, for that. And you know, over the last, uh, well, just about every week, it seems, I send a prayer request out with a number of individuals, and, and uh, uh, these are not general prayer requests. They're often very specific, and for people that are going through a crisis and a tough situation, and, and uh, so when you see something come over your email and it says prayer request, it's somebody that needs prayer immediately. And let's not forget, uh, I have not met this family or this young boy, but as Tim and Dee, their neighbor, a five-year-old boy that was attacked by a family dog, uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and just had over 800 stitches and 500 stitches that was in his skull. Um, and uh, fortunately, and just through the providence of God that um, there's only four stitches, I think you said, on his face. Uh, he was having some uh, visual problems and control problems the other day, but the doctors are feeling that he is going to have a recovery. But let's remember to pray for this little boy. And the reason I'm talking about prayer this morning, the reason I'm talking about answer to prayer, and Mary, it was awesome to have you up here today. We've been praying for you, lady, and uh, I'm just so thankful for God spared your life with what you went through a couple of weeks ago. But we also have been praying for a number of other people. And, and this morning, is, is uh, I, I want to take a moment because I don't ever want God to think we're taking him for granted. I don't ever want him to think that we're taking answers to prayer for granted. I'm going to ask if Joyce Thomas would come and join me here in the front. And uh, I want Joyce, as we have been praying for her, and she has been going through just a lot of stuff and treatments and various things and uh, with fighting uh, some cancer issues, and I want her to share a little bit of her story. Thank you. Um, you all, I appreciate all your prayers. We've been praying ever since I found out that the stage four cancer has returned for the third time. In uh, 1970, my husband's mother died of uh, cancer, and so it became a big fear for me. Uh, I knew I could never face anything like that. Uh, uh, she died in 1970, and in 1971, I found a lump on my breast. And so I panicked, and I went to the doctor, and he said, you're too young to have breast cancer. Uh, you'll be okay, just forget it. Well, that didn't help me, because I had this fear, so I went to a specialist. Yeah, he said the same thing. He said, you're gonna be okay, it's, it's just um, you're too young to have breast cancer. The following year, uh, I still carried my fears, and Bill and I got down on our knees and asked God to take care of a major situation in our life, and he miraculously took care of us. And I thought if he could do that, surely he could take this fear away because this isn't an abundant life that I'm experiencing. I'm fearful of things I shouldn't be. I'm not trusting God, except I knew I was going to heaven. And so I got down on my knees and I started giving everything to him and my kids and my home, everything. I had David, my son, is out here. He was three years old and uh, Carla was four, Bill was nine. So I started giving everything to the Lord and the last thing I gave him was my health and my, and my fears. And, uh, and I asked him to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, a warmth came over me, and the whole world lifted off my shoulders. 
as uh, I raised my hands praising and thanking him, these three came running up to see who I was talking to. And when I held them in my arms, it felt like they went right into to the inside. It was, it was such a love I'd never experienced. I didn't know that the following month I would go to for my regular checkup and I hadn't thought about this lump. And the doctor said, I think we need to do a biopsy, but we're 99.9% .9 sure it's not cancer. Well, it turned out that it was a four hour surgery after a radical mastectomy. The cancer had already spread to six lymph nodes. And when he came in to talk to me, he said, it's cancer. And I said, but you got it all, didn't you? And he said, I'm sorry. Um, what we're going to have to do is take your ovaries, do radiation therapy, and you'll live six months to a year. Well, I have these kids I wanted to raise, and I thought this can't be. Well, God intervened. He came and touched me in the hospital. I remember uh, I had been praying. I asked him if I could just touch the hem of his garment. I knew I'd be okay, and I reached up to ask him for healing. And the next day I was uh, laying there, and I felt Bill holding my hand. And I turned to say something, well, Bill wasn't in the room, but the presence of God was. So I'm telling the doctors I'd been healed. And I, I started talking about my healing, and the next day I got a scripture from a friend, Isaiah 41, 13, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold your right hand, saying unto you, fear not, I will help you. And it was my right hand. God took away the fear, and I went through the surgeries, I went through the radiation, and I was ready to go home, and the doctor came in and he said, we'd like you to see a psychiatrist. And I said, okay. <laughs> he, I said, why? I have perfect peace. And he said, you may, but you're not accepting the fact that you have cancer. I said, I don't. And he said, well, you, you're, you're going to die, and you're only accepting this. And I said, I'm not going to die. I know God has touched me. And he said, well, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? Well, I was pretty much a roadmap by then with all the surgeries that they had done. I said, no, but what's inside is, and if you'll sit down, I'm gonna tell you what Jesus has done for me. And he did. <laughs> so that was my fear of being healed uh, in 1972, 43 years ago. In 1993, I was coming home from work and I had a sharp pain in my chest and I thought I've got pneumonia or I'm having a heart attack, so I put in, went into the instant clinic and he said, everything looks okay, you don't have pneumonia, but let's do a chest x-ray. And he came back and he said, oh my goodness, you need to get to Emory Clinic as fast as you can. You have a mass on your lungs, it was the size of a lemon. So at that time I thought, I, I can't believe that this could be cancer again. I knew God had touched me and I will tell you, adrenaline flowed through me. Uh, and a friend brought me this CD. It's Healing Scriptures. You can have it. Healing Scriptures by Pastor John Hagee. So I started listening to the, he's reading scriptures, and peace came over me again. And that was 22 years later, stage four cancer. So after Bill died this January, I, I was, we thought he, God would raise him up and he would be healed. He wasn't. God decided to take him on home, no, probably knowing what I was going to go through. Uh, in fact, we were so sure Bill said he was going to buy a truck in the week before he died. And uh, anyway, I, I went through his funeral and, and was preparing for all the paperwork and everything, not thinking. I just did my regular checkup and went to my oncologist for a regular checkup. And she said, well, your blood work is fine. And I said, well, something's not right. And so when she examined me, there was a mass on my other breast. And um, so we began the procedure of, um, the, it was just a, a biopsy and uh, ultrasounds and mammograms. And then I got my PET scan back. And, and it read, uh, there unfortunately is evidence of reoccurrence. Well, it's four pages of where the cancer is. It was in my breast, it was in my lymph nodes, it was in my neck and my abdomen, it was in my bone, rib bone and my sternum bone, pretty much everywhere, so stage four cancer again. And they decided they maybe should put me on a new program that had come out called iBrants. It was for mes uh, metastatic breast reoccurrences. And so uh, we were, I was praying and asking God, what, what do I do? And I got a call from pastor and asked if I'd like to talk to Greg, who was the, the uh, chief 
office, uh, chief CE, COO of the American Cancer Society, and he put me in touch with the medical, the, the one that was the chief medical advisor, and so I ran by him my test. He wanted to look at my PET scan, and in the meantime, my sister-in-law from Florida called and said, I know the man that's the head of the oncology at Mayo Clinic. He'd like to look at your PET scan. So I sent it to him. So we had these people looking at it and my doctor's advice and um, decided to go along with the program she has suggested. On Mother's Day, I was anointed with oil and prayed for by all of you, which... The next day, I, I had no pain in, in my chest or breast or arm anywhere and I couldn't feel the mass. So I went, went in the very following day and I told my doctor, I think the mass is gone. Well, she was so involved with this new program, she didn't even examine me, actually. And uh, so we started on the program, and the, the very first day after, I went back to the surgeon, and she said, I can't find the mass, but I was on the program for four months and didn't really have any major side effects at all. I maybe have a little bit thinner hair and some skin issues, but um, so I went back in on Thursday a week ago to get my next PET scan. And it's four pages and it talks about every one of those lymph nodes and everything. But it starts out, uh, and I will tell you that the, the man that read it could hardly wait to get to my oncologist and talk to him. And the first thing he said was, what are you doing over there? And this one reads, there is a significant response to the therapy since the prior PET scan. And most of the nodes were remarkably decreased and some completely have been resolved. Um, the bone sternum has minimal activity and the cancer in the rib is gone. Completely. So, that's it. Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I still have your tape. I'll give it back to you. Well, that was worth coming to church today to hear, wasn't it? I mean, do we serve a great God or not? And is there a reason for us to continue to pray? And I, it is my hope, and, and, I, and Joyce, thank you so much. And it's so great to have, your, uh, have some of your family with you today to hear this. And I, I tell you what, we love your mom. Uh, she is just a gem, and, and we, we loved your, your dad. And, and uh, I, I honestly would have to say that I put Bill and Joyce Thomas, of all of the people I've ever run across over the years, as two people who have certainly would be high on the list as people who have great faith. When Bill was supposedly dying, I don't know how many times, but he, the family came together and they said, look, I don't want you to worry about me because when you die and go to heaven, you'll find me under the big tree. We're going to have a meeting place there. I'd never heard anybody use those terms like that. But again, it was the faith and the assurance. But we're glad that Joyce is going to be around with us for a while. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about not just things in life, but I think so often we want God to do everything for us. I mean everything. There are folks I just know that are either sitting in this place this morning or watching over the streamline or we'll, we'll be listening to this over the, uh, an audio version of it later, uh, who knows, maybe months or years down the road. But there are some people who are going through some really difficult times, whether it is with their personal life or with their marriage, with their children, maybe finances, maybe relationally, maybe with occupations or whatever. And, and we said, I just don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I don't know where to go. Well, hopefully the testimony that you've just heard this morning will at least nudge you in the right direction, and that is that we come to God and we seek him. But God doesn't do everything. 
there are some things that he requires of you and me, and that's what I want to talk to you about. Quite often, I will ask people if I'm doing a Bible study or, uh, or, or just talking with people, and I'll say, do you have a favorite scripture? They do. Or I will ask, do you have a favorite Bible story? Almost invariably, and Bible stories would just click, 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 click. They, people just love to talk about their favorite Bible story. I would say 99% of a favorite Bible story of anyone has to do with a miracle. We love miracles, don't we? We love God jumping in and doing something that nobody else can do. It is a wonderful, wonderful story. Well, the Bible is filled with those. But today, I want to not only share a number of my favorite stories, but what I believe is the absolute number one priority, the number one ingredient necessary for anyone who desires to live for God victoriously day by day. It is the basic ingredient for any marriage wanting Christ to be the head of their home. It is the basic ingredient that will keep a single adult on track. It is the ingredient that will keep a teenager from being influenced for evil. It is the basic ingredient that will help us in our personal spiritual growth or when we battle temptation or in overcoming a sin or running your home, running your business or controlling your finances. It will help you when you face unemployment or when you have stress on the job or stress anywhere for that matter. I'm going to tell you today, or what I'm going to tell you, is that if you do not have this as an active part of your life, you are going to struggle spiritually. You'll struggle spiritually all of your life. If you do not make this a basic ingredient, you are going to struggle all of your life in spiritual things. You're going to lose more battles than you'll win, and there's no way on earth that you can live a life of faith without this ingredient. And before I give you that, I want to read the first five verses from Psalm 132. Psalm 132 from the New Living Translation. The Lord remembered David and all that he suffered. He took an oath before the Lord. He vowed to the Mighty One of Israel. And here's what he said. Here was the vow. He said, I will not go home. I will not let myself rest. I will not let my, eye, let my eyes sleep, nor close my eyelids in slumber. Until I find a place to build a house for the Lord, a sanctuary for the mighty one of Israel. I want to talk about this for a few minutes today. When we think about the hardships that David endured, he certainly was a candidate for low self-esteem. Anybody here battling that today? He was, his own father told him that he was the least of his children. Now David, when we think about David, he had a great victory in killing Goliath, but then he ran from a jealous saw. He committed a great sin with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba gave birth to a baby, and that baby died. David's oldest son, Absalom, wanted to become the king of Israel, and in order to do so, he had to get rid of his father, who was on the throne. Well, he didn't see him dying of old age anytime soon, so Absalom, who was the oldest son of David, recruited an army and put them together and brought an army against Israel for the very fact of killing his own father. David got word that this was going to happen and he went and hid in the mountains because he himself did not want to fight against his own son. Well, we'll save that for another story. David survived. Absalom got killed. But that was another hardship that David had to endure. The psalmist reminds us 
to do what David did when he was surrounded by the enemy. The psalmist reminds us when a battle is about to be fought, here's what you do. And it is the first line on your outline. You want to write this word. Prayer. You pray. You pray. David said, I'll not enter my house, nor will I go to bed. I will not sleep or even close my eyes until I find a place for God in my life. Friends, that is the basic ingredient. It's called prayer. We've had people in our church experiencing some tough times. We pray for them. We knew, if we knew about the problem, we could be a little more specific. It might be someone who is going through a hard time personally, or they have a loved one that is ill, or, or maybe someone that, that we know personally, this wasn't public, but we know that someone is having a flirtation with sin or immoral behavior, making poor choices. We know that it not only affects your relationship with God, but it affects your relationship with their family, with their spouse, with their friends, and it affects their own testimony. So as I speak to you this morning, I know that there are people listening. And if you don't today, you will have at some point a broken heart. You're going to sense loneliness. You'll be discouraged, overwhelmed with what the future might hold. Some people are afraid. And some of the wonderful people, these wonderful people go to bed at night, and some of you have, with tears in your eyes. And in the morning you climb out of bed, only to find out that the storm has not yet died out. And you say, okay, Pastor, that's, that's true, that's me, but what can I do about it? And here are some examples from Scripture that God required something of them before he met their needs. Now, I'm, I'm going to share very briefly the story, but I'm going to give you five different situations that these came in. And the very first one was, is that the Bible tells us of a man who was a paralytic, and he laid by the poolside for 38 years. Now, 38 years is a long time. This man was paralytic. He couldn't walk. He was not dependent upon himself. He had to depend upon others. He had to have others that would take him out and they'd put him by the pool every single day. Because in that day and at that particular pool, when the waters became troubled, the first one that could get into the pool would be healed. But there was a problem. The man couldn't get himself in for 38 years. Now, I know that you're wondering, probably like I've been wondering, man, if I was hauling you out to the pool every morning and then going and taking you back at night, I think I would stay with you and kick you in the pool when the waters got troubled. But we don't have anybody telling us that that was done. It just says he was there for 38 years. And wouldn't you know it, one day Jesus walked by. Listen to me carefully. Jesus is going to walk by somebody in just a couple minutes. And it might be you. Jesus walked by this man that was lying there by the pool. The man looked up at Jesus. Will you heal me? And Jesus looked at him and he said, do you really want to be healed? Jesus is walking by somebody. And down deep in your heart, you have a need, a care, a concern. And you're saying, oh God, help me. And Jesus is going to ask you right now, do you really want the answer to this need? Do you really want this relationship to get married or to get better? Do you want your marriage to improve? Do you really want resolution to this problem? Do you, whatever it is that you are praying over, now listen, it's one thing as we heard this marvelous, marvelous testimony of Joyce about an illness, an illness that the doctor, some of the best in the land said, you know what, you're going to die. God always has the final answer. 
He has the last word every single day. He has the last word in your situation. I might be talking to someone today and you are facing a tough thing and you say, there's no way out. I battled this thing for years. And, and, and you know what? I, I worried about it when I went to bed last night. I, I tossed and turned throughout the night. When I got up this morning, it was still there. It might be a battle you're fighting yourself or a battle or a burden you're carrying for someone else. I prayed, I've saw it, I've hoped, but it never goes away. Jesus comes and says, do you really want? Do you really as he said to this paralytic, do you really want to get well? Well, that's a dumb question, wouldn't you think? What would you say? Of course! And Jesus said, get up. Get up. This man had never stood. What do you mean, get up? I can't get up. Then you'll never be healed. I'm afraid. Then you will never sense the power of God. Don't, I, I, you're asking me to do something that I can't do. And because you're not doing it, you will never see the power of God that will come and help you. As Jesus walks by you this morning, do you really want to get well? You say, well, of course I do. I want this need met. I want to have this relationship with him. I want to have a stronger relationship with my loved ones or, or this broken fellowship with somebody. I want that to be restored. I, 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 I so desperately, Jesus will ask you to do something that you feel absolutely, totally incapable of doing. God requires something of us. Not only did he say, get up, he said, pick up your bed. Why? Why pick up the bed? Because that, that mat that he'd been laying on, well, that was his existence, basically, lying on a mat every day for 38, excuse me, for 38 years. God would tell you to get up and pick up whatever it is that you've been harboring and holding and the, and the excuses that you have had of not going forward. Why does God say pick it up? Because he doesn't want you to be able to fall back into the same old trap again. For some of you, that might be, God says, you got some bad influence, some bad influential friends, you need to cut it off. You say, well, I can't do that, I'll hurt them. Do you want to get well? Well, I, whatever it is that God would ask, he told this man, he said, get up, pick up your bed, and then walk. He says, I can't, I'm a cripple, then you'll never be well. I can't get up unless you try. You'll never learn what God can do for you. Well, there's another one, Naaman the leper. He was a commander of an army. He was highly regarded. He was a valiant soldier. He was, I mean, he was Mr. Everything. Now, listen, in, in that day, a leper, when you think about Naaman, and I hadn't really thought about this in regards to Naaman until this week as I was thinking more and more about him. Laman was the captain of a Syrian army. He was a man of prestige. He was a man of influence. But the Bible says he was a leper. Lepers were outcasts. How in the world could a man with leprosy continue to be the influence, basically, of a nation? There was something very special, very unique about this man. Now, I'm not saying that people hung around him. A young girl, and by the way, on Sunday night services, I have been talking about spiritual giants. And from Hebrews chapter 11, I've been taking, I've talked about Moses, talked about Rebecca, talked about, I forget who else I've talked about. But tonight, we're going to talk about this servant girl, this girl that is unnamed in Scripture. So if you're free at 6 o'clock tonight, come and be with us. We'll meet right over here. But a young servant girl, she was a servant to Naaman's wife, 
came to Naaman one day and said, Naaman, if you want to get well, you need to go see a prophet. Now, there's a lot I'd like to say about this servant girl, but I want to save that for tonight. But word gets out to Naaman. He goes to see Elisha, who is the prophet of God. And the prophet sends a messenger out, and he tells Naaman, he said, go dip in the Jordan seven times, the Jordan River. 2 Kings 5.11 says, Naaman went away angry. He said, I thought he would come out and to see me personally. I thought he would call on the name of the Lord his God. I thought he would wave his hand over my sickness, over the spots, <clears throat> and cure my leprosy. You see, things haven't changed from that day to this. Naaman had a need. And Naaman knew what God should do to take care of that need. Naaman's not any different than you or me, is he? This is what you need to do to heal me. But remember, God doesn't think like you think. His ways are not like your ways. But he is the God who can do the impossible. Naaman, do you want to be healed? Of course. Then you go to the yucky, muddy Jordan River and dip seven times. I don't want to. You don't have to. But unless you do, you'll never know what God can do for you. The third one is David. He goes out to face Goliath. The Lord tells him to put a stone in a slingshot and let her fly. What if I miss? Unless you shoot it, you'll never see what God will do for you until you let it go. Number four is Joshua. I could tell you some things about Joshua and Jericho, but let me just give a great, great Bible verse. You ought to write this down in your notes. It's Joshua 3, verse 5. Joshua told the people, <clears throat> consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things. In Joshua 3, the Lord speaks to Joshua. There's a big battle coming. You're going to be surrounded by a number of armies. And you'll be surrounded, but the Jordan River is right out in front of you. He said, I want you to get 12 men, one representing each tribe of Israel. Have them carry the Ark of the Covenant out in front of Israel. And have it done by 12 priests. And when they're, they step into the water, it'll roll back in a heap. And you can pass over to the other side safely. The Bible says in Joshua 3.17 that when the priest stepped into the water, they stepped on dry ground. What if the men had said, carry a box, step into water? Joshua, you're crazy. I wonder how many times we think when we are prompted to do something of the Lord, we say that's crazy. God says, can you imagine Joshua come, Lord, the priests and the people of, uh, of uh, all of these people, they're saying, this is really stupid. It's dumb. And he said, okay. You don't have to do it. Do you have another plan? Nope. Are you going to protect us? Yes. How are you going to protect us? Get 12 men, carry the box, tell them to step in the water. Joshua would say, you can do what you think is best or you can obey God. It's your choice. But if you do it your way, you will never see the power of God and you're going to be defeated. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, some people would be tempted to say that the water wasn't very deep and it wasn't uh, really, it didn't really roll back. The Israelites just walked across shallow water. Wrong. Joshua 3.15 says the water was at flood stage. Joshua 3.17 says the priest stood on dry ground. Now listen, you can believe whatever you want to believe, or you can believe God's word. It's your choice. Then there's Gideon. A young boy, the smallest member of a family, smallest tribe, 
that he was uh, uh, of Israel. And God came to him and he said, you are a warrior, Gideon. You're a mighty man of valor. Now they were surrounded with a Midianite army. They were about to slaughter Israel. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and other uh, eastern peoples, they joined forces to come against Israel. I think it was like Gideon started off with like 22,000 men. God says, Gideon, you got way too many men. You've, you've, got to, you've got to change that. Well, no, he had more than that. He had 32,000. And then when he said, hey, 22,000 of you, or, or any of you that want to fight, you can go home. 22,000 of them left. They knew the battle was going to be greater than what they could fight. Now there was 10,000 left. Gideon, the Lord tells Gideon, you've still got too many men. His army was reduced to 300 men. And they went out to fight the forces of the Midianites crazy. The odds are against you. The gods, the odds may be against you this morning. There is absolutely no way, hope, or reason. And, and that's why I wanted Joyce to share her testimony this morning. There's no answer except God. Very quickly, there's four principles that God gave Joshua. Write these down, hang on to this outline, and you use it in the days ahead. Number one is the principle of silence. This is what God told Joshua. He said, I want you to, want you now, as they face Jericho, and Jericho was a fortified city, the big walls around it. He said, I want you to march around the city once a day. Divide up your people, some from every tribe, have some priests and soldiers, but be sure to take the Ark of the Covenant. This represented God's personal presence in the Old Testament. When you get these people, I want you to go to that city. I want you to march around the walls six consecutive days, but don't say a word. On the seventh day, march around it seven times without talking. Do you, do you know that silence is loud? Sometimes we are so busy doing things that we can't hear God speaking to us. The first principle was silence. The second principle is submission. Joshua near Jericho, he saw a man standing there and he asked this person in Joshua 5.13, are you for us or for our enemies? In Joshua 6, Joshua gets the instructions on what to do at Jericho. But in chapter 5, that comes before chapter 6. And in chapter 5, we see Joshua falling face down in reverence before this man, and he asked the question, what message does my Lord have for this servant? Wow. The commander of the Lord's army says, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. In other words, you are in the presence of God. Joshua is modeling obedience. Before he acts, he comes before God. And because of his example, the people will follow him in obedience in chapter 6. The third principle is the principle of strategy. When God gives instructions, he tells us how to do it. There were two and a half to three million people. All of these people could not go and walk around the walls of Jericho. It would take forever. Joshua was, inter was instructed to take the soldiers, the priests, with the ram's horns, and the Ark of the Covenant. The people of Jericho watched with interest as these people showed up every morning and walked around their walls. They must have thought they were crazy. Without saying a word, day after day for six days, and then on the seventh day, seven times, they went around the wall. After the seventh time, the priests blew their trumpets and the people shouted, and the walls came tumbling down. The people of Jericho were so shook up, they became easy prey for the Israelites. God has a plan, and rarely does it match your plan. One more thing, the principle of spirituality. In the middle of these people marching around the wall, was the Ark of the Covenant. 
This was God's physical presence. And this caused the people to be in awe of God. The people looked over their four walls and they saw God there in the form of this box. The Ark of the Covenant was a physical, visible sign of God's presence. We do not have the Ark of the Covenant today. But we have the Word of God and we have his presence that lives within us. The power of the Holy Spirit. Are you afraid? Are you facing something that is like the paralytic who was powerless? You're facing something and you wish you could do something, but you don't know what to do or you just physically can't do anything? You need to take the first step and do what God wants you to do and trust him to do the rest. Two weeks from today, we're having Friend Day. I've been asking you to invite family and friends, people that you know that don't go to church to come. You, uh, for some, that throws you out of a comfort zone. Oh, I just don't want to do that. I, okay. What you're basically saying is, I, I like my friends, but I could care less about them spiritually. That's, that really, that's what you're saying. The bottom line of it is, you're saying, I don't care whether they go to heaven or hell. Now, you wouldn't admit to that. But that is a fact. It's an, un, it's an unwritten fact. If no one else is invited to church, and you won't invite them to church, and they don't ever hear about the Christ who died for them and loves them, you really don't think you're telling them something? You say, well, how do I do that? First, you make up your mind you're going to do it. Ask God to give you the opportunity, and he will. And then you do it. But I don't know what to say. Take one of the invitation cards in the back and hand it to them and say, look, on September 27th, we're having Friend Day at the church. You are my friend. I would be honored if you would come. Is that hard? You say, well, what if they say no? What if they say yes? Well, what difference would it make? So they come to church one day. What if they found Christ? It changes their life. It may change their home. It'll change their future. Somebody who is a paralytic and Jesus said, do you really want to get well? Do you want to see your church grow? Really? We can talk about it. Well, we even can pray about it. But there comes a time we have to get up. When we get up, God gives us the power and the strength to do it. But let me close with this. I wanted to throw that in because I wanted you to be thinking about that, and you've got two more weeks, and I hope you are doing your very best. I'm going to pray, but let's go back to whatever issues you might be facing or experiencing in your life. God can help you with that. And whatever you are facing and experiencing in your life may be a surprise to you, but it is not a surprise to him. But he's walking by this morning and saying, you say, Jesus, can you help me? Do you really think he can help you? I believe you do think he can help you. But he will require something of you first. If you do your part, He'll do his part. He said, if you confess your sins, I'll forgive you. If you call unto me, I'll answer you. If, if. He always said, if you do this, I will do that. You say, well, why doesn't he just do it? Because he wants you to be faithful and obedient and trust him. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd use these words today and God, if nothing else, would you use the testimony that was shared this morning by Joyce? And God, I just want to just personally and publicly give you thanks for touching this lady that has just astounded the doctors. Continue to be with her in the days ahead. But I pray for that individual that's sitting here today. It might be a couple. 
And they might be facing something and they are just, they're afraid. They're worried about the future, worried about tomorrow. They're not sure how things are going to turn out. And they're doing everything they can and they feel as though that they're in a boat rowing upstream. And they're not making any headway. But Jesus walks by. I see him. I see him in my spirit. I sense his presence in my soul. I sense his touch upon my life, upon my shoulder, saying, if you'll let me, I'll help you. But here's what I'll have you do. Whether it's to go to that person, whether it's just to claim forgiveness for sin, or whatever it might be to do, and we are afraid and we're nervous and we're anxious. But if we do what God is directing us, God will give us the power and he'll also do that which we cannot do. If there's someone here this morning that doesn't know you as their personal savior, oh God, I pray that you would speak to their heart and that they would confess their sin and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life right now. Forgive me of my sin. I want to walk out of this place knowing that I have a personal relationship with you. Now, Father, as we receive our tithes and our offerings this morning, as we receive the connection card and uh, responses to the backside where there's a lot of different things and uh, that's coming up in the future, God, I pray for your blessings upon each and every one. I thank you, God, for the faithful obedience of our people, of honoring you with their tithes and their offerings. God, we love you and we thank you for all that you have done. In your name we pray, amen. God, God, is that you? Where have you been, son? I've taken a break from the word and gotten to the world a little. Backslidden, the saints would say. I paint today a new day just so the sorrow won't be remembered tomorrow. I borrowed time from the world because I got that feeling. And like Marvin Gaye would say, I needed sexual healing. But perpetually feeling like I knew better, I couldn't figure out what better I knew. And I figured you were pretty pissed, so I didn't bother to come to you. You are still a little boy. Ex excuse me, God? No offense against your royalty, but show me a little loyalty and keep it real. You know good and well I'm not a boy. I just might have took a detour or ran into a decoy, but my core is still right, though. And plus, you look at a person's heart, and you know it was hard for me to refuse that temptation in that given situation. Why you contemplate in my manhood? I thought I'd stand good with you as long as I come back and repent. And plus, the times I spent in the world doesn't compare to the times I spent thinking of you. So give me a break. Give you a break. I owe you nothing. But you, you were bought at a price, and it's only right that you dedicate me your life. See, I want to open up doors for you so that through you, others will see me. I understand that you may be confused by some portraying themselves to be me, but they'll never see me if you're of the world. You see, the devil knows scriptures too. It's not enough to every now and then brush up on the scripture or two. Give you a break. Don't you know every breath you take is considered a break because my grace is saving you from going to that place. Now count the breaks you get in one day. You do the math. Every day I'm sparing you from my wrath even after you've taken baths and pool of sin. Again and again I consider you my son, my love, my friend. Even when you prefer to spend your time trying to blend in. We're not clearly made for you to stand out. When you get to my pearly gates, there won't be no handouts. So it's time for you to become a man now or stand down because clearly you can't see that you've been chosen. Instead, choosing when you're finding the word close to your heart. You see, temptation is a part of life and my grace is just a taste of the love I have for you after every time you give in. From night to morning, I watched over you while you were snoring. And even when it was storming, I made sure there was no harm in you. I'm warning you, not fussing. 
and you know warning comes before destruction. So while you're at her lusting, sinning, and grinning, think I am the end and the beginning. And quit pretending like you woke yourself up this morning. You know as the story is told, what good is a man to gain the world but lose his soul? Don't lose control and go ahead and show up. It's time to stop playing Christian and really grow up and throw up your old ways. See, when you were a boy, you thought like a boy. But now that you're a man, you must leave your childish ways behind you. And don't let the glare of sin blind you. You can have fun when it's time to. But for now, stop running from conviction and let it find you. But God, I don't think you understand how hard it is to have the upper hand being the underdog. God, being convicted by you is not what I'm afraid of. I'm more concerned with the rate of people that will come in and call me hypocrite. I've seen it all before and quite frankly, I'm sick of it. Convicted with the addiction of making fleshful decisions has corrupted my vision and made me vulnerable. And God, to be one of the only ones living right is so uncomfortable. People will look at me with such scrutiny. It would be a lot different if it was just you and me. And if I began to live holy, then the people that really know me would just compare me to the old me. They wouldn't show me respect, God. I'll spread your word if someone asks me about it. That's okay. Right, God? Whining, lying, and complaining is all you seem to do. You find time to do everything you want, but nothing I ask of you. But you expect me to have grace every time you come my way? You seem to remember me every Sunday, but forget about me on days like today. What if I was to dismiss you? Then who would spare your life? What if I decided to take a break? Then what would you expect from your creator? What if I just decided to walk off and just decide to come back later? You don't realize the things I invest in you and all the talent I give you as a gift. So let's just reverse our roles and I'll let you take my second shift. No, don't ask any questions. I'm handing the power over to you. Now your life is in your hands. Your destiny belongs to you. God, wait. I apologize. Just listen. I apologize for fitting in when I know you made me different. I just thought that maybe this time Maybe this time... Time! Not even my own son knows the second or hour. I made you a king, though you were born a coward. Son, I listen to your every word. There is nothing you say I don't hear. I open up your eyes to see all things and wipe the mud away for you to see clear. My son, Jesus doesn't even know you want me to freeze time for you. I'm calling on you for your calling, but it's obvious you have other things to do. You're afraid of what people will say, but I'm the only one you should fear. Father, time works on my watching. Mother Earth will soon disappear. You may not understand, and this may come as a surprise, but I'll explain it to you because I'm sick of the lies. I'm the divine truth, and nothing shall come before me. How can I explain to you how to be faithful if when I speak, you just ignore me? I give you every inch of power you have to conquer all that you may fear. But consider my voice to be hours on the clock. The end of times are near. Okay, God, I'll change. I promise I'll change, but I might as well get used to people looking at me strange. Who cares? And what about my imperfections and everything of my past? I perfected your imperfections and made beauty of your past. I made you first when you thought you were last. You see, my love is unconditional. It's something you've never felt. I've forgiven you of everything, even when you couldn't forgive yourself. God, what if I fall? You will. And then what? I'll pick you up. And even then, God, what if I fall? I'll pick you up. But God, what if I keep on falling? I'll keep picking you up. But God, but nothing. You will always fall short of my grace. That's not to debate. You should face every day knowing that you have been saved by grace. Let the melodies from heaven rain down on you and take that Bible off the shelf. Stop depending on everyone else. Sometimes you have to encourage yourself. It ain't over until I say it's over, so wipe those tears from your face. You have to continue to move swiftly and make every move in faith. I can continue to show you the right path and you can continue to talk to me. But your words mean nothing unless you're ready to walk with me. God, I surrender. Son, just walk.
As uh, was just announced, the children's choir is beginning, uh, and that will start at 4 o'clock, the rehearsal, 4 o'clock this afternoon here. Thanks for being here. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful afternoon.